And I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, I welcome the Audit Scotland's recommendations that were set out in their recent annual overview of the NHS. Indeed, we've already been taking decisive action to deliver them. They highlight the challenges faced by our health service, similar to challenges being faced by health services across the UK and beyond. Importantly, the report acknowledges that our committed workforce has continued to deliver high quality care. And I pay tribute today to all of our health and social care staff who deliver outstanding services day in and day out. As the Auditor General recognised last week, demands on the service from Scotland's ageing population are growing. Since 2013, for example, we have seen 13% more cancer patients receiving treatment under the 62-day referral standard, an increase of 26% in CT scans, an increase in of 34% in MRI scans, and an increase of over 15% in CAMS patients. A small snapshot of the additional demand our health service is coping with. In addition to demographic change, we also face price pressures and rising expectations. But as the First Minister said last week, the task for us is not just to describe the challenge, it is to put the solutions in place. And that is exactly what the Scottish Government is doing. On the 4th of October, I published the medium-term health and social care financial framework to give more detail on how the potential approach required to deliver a financially balanced and sustainable health and social care system now and for the years ahead. Last week, I published our Waiting Times Improvement Plan. This will see more than £850 million of investment through phased, focused and decisive action to secure substantial and sustainable improvements to performance. Solutions will be different in different areas of the country and in different specialties, but the drive for improvement is national in scope requiring a focused, intense programme of work that accelerates action that is already underway. From my statement of the 4th of October, members will be aware of my commitment to facilitate a new planning and performance cycle for all NHS boards. Audit Scotland have recommended that this is supported by a robust and transparent financial management system. And that is exactly what we intend and further detail on the new approach will be provided as part of the 2019-20 budget. The new arrangements will require boards to deliver a break-even position over a three-year period, rather than annually, as is the case currently. In each year, boards will have 1% flexibility on their annual resource budget um, to allow them scope to marginally underspend or overspend in that year. Presiding Officer, Audit Scotland recognised in the report that there was a range of work underway to strengthen governance arrangements, including piloting a standardised review of corporate governance across all boards. The review of NHS corporate governance carried out by John Brown and Susan Walsh will enable us to pursue the adoption of good practice across all boards. And yesterday I met our NHS board chairs and task them with implementing those recommendations by the end of this financial year. Our review of progress with integration will report in the new year and will consider areas where integration is working well, along with any where governance and accountability can be improved. We are also committed to ensuring that all non-executive members of boards have the necessary training, skills and expertise to fulfil their roles effectively. In terms of addressing leadership positions, Project LIFT is a new approach to recruit, retain, develop and manage talent within the NHS in Scotland to ensure the very best and most able leaders reach boardrooms. In terms of capital investment, Audit Scotland's report recommends the development of a national capital investment strategy. I agree, and members will again be aware from my statement on the 4th of October of my commitment to bring a capital investment strategy to Parliament by the end of this financial year. This new strategy will create a framework considering necessary investment over the longer term and will accompany the medium-term health and social care financial framework to create an integrated overview of the funding needed across Scotland's health and care system. <coughs> 
This will include important investment in primary and community care projects, which will be key in delivering the emerging health and social care integration agenda and shifting the balance of care from hospitals to local facilities and people's homes. Audit Scotland recommended that a clear understanding of demand and capacity should inform workforce planning. Again, I agree with them. Our fully integrated health and social care workforce plan that we will publish by the end of this year will encourage all health and social care providers to adopt a comprehensive approach to workforce planning in order to ensure that workforce resources are deployed as efficiently as possible. Lastly, I welcome Audit Scotland's recommendation about publishing clear and easy to understand information on how the health funding system works, including information about levels of spending. The Parliament knows that we are committed to ensuring transparency on health funding and that we have recently introduced regular reporting of the financial position of NHS, NHS boards and integration authorities. This is essential in providing the clarity necessary for the important discussion that we will need to have about the future shape of our NHS and social care services. Presiding officer, our financial framework was predicated on what I described in an earlier statement as the perhaps bold assumption that the UK government will honour its commitment delivering the consequentials as a true net benefit. I regret to tell the Parliament that the UK government has failed to keep that commitment. I'm very disappointed that yesterday's UK autumn budget confirmed that the UK government would shortchange Scotland's NHS by a total of £54.5 million next year and by over £270 million over the period to 2023-24. That the UK government has shortchanged our health service by £54.5 million compared to their claimed level of consequentials in the summer is an insult to our NHS and the people who depend on it. In addition, the UK government have not set out the consequential funding that would be delivered beyond next year, leaving open the possibility of the NHS funding commitment being further eroded. Not least, as the Chancellor has more than hinted at the potential of a totally revised budget from the UK government as a result of them crashing us out of Europe with a no-deal Brexit. Notwithstanding this disappointing, but regrettably not surprising step by the UK government, the Scottish Government remains committed to channel every penny of health consequentials into Scotland's health service. And I can assure members today that despite the actions of the UK Government, we remain committed to our programme for government promises and our recently announced waiting times plan. Returning to the Audit Scotland overview report, it is understandable that due to the timing of the report, Audit Scotland were not able to fully reflect that the framework sets out additional funding for the health portfolio of £3.3 billion by 2023-24. This expected increase would mean an annual growth for the health portfolio of 2.9% in real terms. And as Audit Scotland's report says, the Fraser of Allender Institute predicts that the health resource budget is likely to have to increase by around 2% per year to stand still. This is a vitally important point about funding and sustainability, which is not, again, understandably, but is not reflected by Audit Scotland in their report. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I welcome this annual contribution from Audit Scotland. I accept the recommendations in full, and as I have set out in this statement, I am taking the steps necessary to ensure that the challenges are addressed. We have a record number of staff, record funding in excess of £13 billion this year, and even more investment planned by this Scottish Government. Although essential, this will not be enough, and we must continue to follow our twin approach of investment and reform. I now look forward to working together across this chamber in a responsible and mature manner to deliver this, and to ensure a balanced and sustainable health and social care system for the years ahead. And I commend this statement. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We move now to questions, starting with uh, Brian Whittle to be followed by Monica Lynn. Brian okay, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance notice uh, of her statement. Presiding Officer, another week, uh, another ministerial statement on health. Um, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government are waking up to the fact that I have been failing the NHS over their 11-year tenure. If the Scottish Government had been paying attention to the day job, the Cabinet Secretary's statement that we have an ageing population would hardly have come as a surprise. Yet we have a shortfall in the GPs of some 850 across Scotland. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary announced an extra 400 training places, training that takes seven years to complete. I'm afraid, Cabinet Secretary, that still remains a shortfall, hardly prudent workforce planning. And it doesn't even take into account any future trends. The fact that such a high proportion of our nursing staff are approaching retirement age was hardly difficult to work out and plan for. Yet in 2012, the then Health Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon cut training places for our nurses and midwives, short-sighted, and we are seeing the consequences on the ward today. Cabinet Secretary, you say there is a record investment in our Scottish NHS. What you conveniently failed to mention is that it's a direct result of Barnet consequentials. And yesterday, the Scottish Government were handed nearly £1 billion extra which they can, they can uh, uh, have complete autonomy mm -hmm. to spend as they see fit. We know that the Scottish NHS will get £214 million extra this year, with a further £720 million this, next year. So can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary, following the damning Audit Scotland report on the state of the NHS finances, which stated, after 11 years of SNP government, and I quote, that meeting key targets are on a downward spiral because its current model is not financially is, is sustainable whether she will ensure that this funding boost from the UK Government will go directly to the NHS, or will she continue to follow the Scottish Government's usual pattern of finding a grievance for every solution? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Mr Whittle for his uh, comments and questions. I'm always happy to come to this Parliament, Presiding Officer, and talk about our health service. It is indeed a successful service and an excellent track record on the part of this government. I'm disappointed, however, that Mr Whittle is surprised that we have an ageing population. We have been talking about that for some time and have taken the steps. I outlined them. It really is a pity people don't listen and read and pay attention. I have taken steps uh, already on the back of this government's track record to further address the challenges that that ageing population and other challenges place on this health service and on health services across the UK. What is different is it is this government that has plans in place and action already underway to address those challenges. And Mr Whittle, we have said, my colleague Mr Mackay said, I have said, we've repeated it, that every single penny of the consequentials for health will be invested in health by this government. But you know, that increased investment of our health service over the track record of this government over many years is about political choice. Mr Whittle, it's not thanks to the UK government continuing to cut the overall budget uh, delivered to this parliament and to this government. It is about the political choices that this government makes which are so much more in tune yeah. with what the people of this country need than a Tory government ever will be. Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Audit Scotland has delivered a damning report on 11 years of SNP mismanagement of our NHS. It should shame this government. Mm -hmm. Under the SNP, the future of our NHS is not financially sustainable. The SNP cut the health budget in real terms last year, despite rising waiting times and rising staff stress levels. Audit Scotland's uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance read the report. The serious challenges facing our NHS requires action. Not more of the same broken promises from this SNP. Jean Freeman's grand plan to improve waiting times will continue to break the law for years to come. It hardly inspires confidence. Today's statement doesn't reveal a plan for the future of our NHS. It is damage control. Jean Freeman herself said last week that her predecessors, Nicola Sturgeon and Shona Robeson, failed to keep their promises on the NHS. So I have to ask, presiding officer, why should the people of Scotland believe that this Cabinet Secretary is any different? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I'm grateful to Ms Lennon for her questions. Can I start by clarifying that Audit Scotland did not say that this government had cut NHS investment? It really is important, and I'm genuine when I have said since the day and hour I was appointed as Cabinet Secretary for Health that I look for a mature and responsible discussion. And the starting point for that has to be accuracy in what we are saying. I am disappointed too that the medium-term financial framework appears not to have been read. Mm. It came, as I made the point, as, as Audit Scotland itself recognises, uh, after the time that Audit Scotland could take full account of it. But that medium-term financial framework shows clearly the intention to invest in the NHS in Scotland beyond the anticipated amount from Fraser of Allender that is required simply to stand still. And the medium-term financial framework also makes clear that what we need is investment and reform. We already have reforms underway. We have significant investment underway. We have undoubtedly challenges, and I have been very honest in recognising those and setting out to deal with them. The big difference, presiding officer, between those of us who sit on these benches and those who sit elsewhere in this chamber is that we face up to those challenges and have a plan in place. Yep. What we do not have are manifesto commitments that would cut our budget for the NHS, yep. reduce the number of nurses yep. and a current non-commitment from the Labour Party at UK level not to reverse the tax cuts for the rich that the Tories want to impose. So if we're looking to see who will the electorate believe? I believe that they will put their trust in us as they currently do, yeah. as a government that delivers because we understand the reality of the situation we need to deal with and we have the plans in place to deal with them, not the slogans that we get from either side of this chamber. Yeah. Alison Johnson to be followed by William A. Thank you. The increase in agency staff costs over the past five years has been staggering, an unsustainable 38% increase with almost £166 million spent last year alone. This isn't a new problem and we can't wait until 2020, spring 2020, for the government's framework for recruitment. So I'd like to understand what the government is doing now. What does it intend to do in the immediate future? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and my thanks to Ms Johnston. She is, of course, correct that agency costs take up too great a proportion of our budget. That is why the workforce recruitment exercises that we've begun are so important, why for the sixth successive year we've increased the numbers of student nurses and midwives in training, why we have only recently announced a significant increase to the non-means-tested bursary for student nurses and midwives, uh, unique here in Scotland compared to uh, the NHS in England, uh, and why we have, for example, undertaken and supported other initiatives in terms of nursing, the return to practice, which we would uh, intend to increase, the uh, transfer uh, course in the, with universities of the Highlands and Islands, the increase in the number of radiographers in training, and the new uh, Scott Gem course uh, with University of uh, St Andrews and Dundee that is a postgraduate course of a shorter duration, clinically approved and safe, but particularly focused on GPs in remote and rural areas. All of those and more are actions that we are currently taking in order to address the particular pockets of recruitment difficulty that we have in our workforce, not, notwithstanding the fact, as Audit Scotland recognises, that the workforce numbers in the NHS of Scotland, in Scotland are higher than they have ever been. Willie Rennie to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, why is it that when it's been two weeks since the worst NHS report by Audit Scotland, there is very little new in the government response today? Workforce planning has been a major long-standing weakness for the government. So why do we have to wait still longer before we see this workforce plan published? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've already published three workforce plans. The workforce plan I'm talking about is the one where we integrate all of those so that we make absolutely certain that we're taking a whole system approach. So I don't understand really why Mr Rennie doesn't recognise that. We, we appreciate 
that workforce planning is a critical element of what we have to do. It is one of the pillars on which our work uh, carries forward. Medium-term financial framework is one. The waiting times improvement is the other. The, the fourth is, of course, the move towards integrated health and social care. And by the end of this parliament, over uh, half a billion pounds uh, annually will be invested in, from frontline NHS budget into the, that integrated health and social care. So I, I would never underestimate the challenges we face and I would never say that there isn't more that we have to do. But the starting point we have to go, all go from is an accurate reflection of exactly where we are and we already have three workforce plans on the stocks. There are nine more questioners if we get a chance to get through them all. Willie Coffey to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given that the Tory UK Government has shortchanged the health service in Scotland by almost £55 million next year, has the UK Government given any indication as to when they will confirm all the health consequentials they have previously claimed through to 2023-24? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, um Thank you to Mr Coffey for his question. No, the UK government has not confirmed uh, when uh, the rest of those consequentials will be uh, announced. Uh, I understand there may be, uh, that may happen in a spring budget, but of course the uncertainty around the spring, the spring uh, statement or budget, however the UK Chancellor wants to uh, frame it, is whether or not we are crashing out of Brexit with no deal or crashing out uh, of the European Union uh, with a deal that none of us understand and is uh, totally unclear. And at the moment, a few short months away from that, that level of uncertainty for our health service and particularly for our workforce in health and social care is of a matter of considerable concern. But at this point, we have no confirmation at all on the rest of the consequentials. Edward Mountain to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned governance and leadership, two areas where your advisers, John Brown and Susan Walsh, have already documented the failures of NHS Highland. And I welcome the meetings that you and I have had, Cabinet Secretary, to discuss this. So perhaps you could explain to me, how will the Scottish Government ensure that the new Chief Executive of NHS Highland, the Chair of the Board, and the similar appointments across Scotland provide the charismatic and positive leadership our excellent doctors and nurses deserve. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to Mr Mountain for his question and also for those productive discussions that we have so far had uh, on NHS Highland, and I'm sure we will continue to have those. Um, there are two particular ways by which um, we have changed how we uh, undertake recruitment, not only in terms of non-executive uh, members of our health boards, but also for those key leadership positions. Uh, and that is uh, what is described as a value-based uh, recruitment exercise, which looks to have more than, if you like, more than one dimension of an applicant before the decision-making panel. It is an approach that has been successfully undertaken uh, in the uh, Golden, uh, Golden Jubilee uh, National Board over many years, is being picked up in other boards, um, and it ensures that those who uh, apply for posts, that consideration is given not only to their previous experience and what they say in their CV and how they answer questions in interview, but also to how they perform in other situations, so that you have a better, a more rounded, if you like, perception of the applicant and therefore uh, can make uh, more informed choices. That alongside the governance work that, as you uh, rightly uh, said, uh, John Brown and Susan uh, Walsh undertook, and my uh, requirement of NHS board chairs that they have implemented that uh, by the end of this financial year, together with uh, the series of ministerial reviews of boards, which are about to begin, uh, where uh, all territorial boards will have a ministerial review where we will look directly uh, at their governance issues and at where we expect to see them improve, at their performance and at the challenges they may face and how we might further assist those. All of those taken in the round, I believe, will see us uh, reach the level of leadership um, that we require across our NHS uh, in our uh, chief executives, but also in our boards, who have the critical and vitally important role of scrutiny and challenge. Charisma, I'm not sure I can promise you, but I can certainly commit to all those others. 
Emma Harper to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. <clears throat> President officer, in her statement, the Cabinet Secretary recognised that increased demands on the health service. For example, in my South Scotland region, we have a particularly high ageing population with increasingly complex health and care needs. Can she therefore outline what action is being taken to meet the demand on these needs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to uh, Ms Harper for her question. Uh, in terms of uh, the, an ageing population, uh, there's two things I want to say. First of all, in terms of that population as it presents to us, um, then obviously that is uh, picked up in terms of the additional capacity that the Waiting Times Improvement Plan with that £850 million investment brings into the service and the system in order to cope with those additional demands in terms of particularly elective healthcare needs, but also diagnostics, that the ageing population largely, but also others, uh, bring to our health service. But the other point I want to make is also in terms of our public health programme um, and the need that we have to, uh, to try and do more in this field of working with uh, mothers before they give birth, hence uh, an element of the mental health plan that Ms Hockey is taking forward around perinatal mental health, uh, our understanding uh, of the impact of ACE, our work with uh, mothers and babies and children, our work in schools, in order to try and ensure that the generations coming behind us have more healthier lifestyles uh, than we currently have, and uh, therefore the demands will change on our health service as we go into the future. That is part of what we talk about as a whole system approach and is part of that investment and reform that I touched on earlier. Kezia Dugdale to be followed by George Adam. Thank you. Audit Scotland reported the NHS Lothian missed all eight performance targets and that six of them weren't even close. Given the Cabinet Secretary has quietly sent in a rescue team led by the head of NHS Northumbria, can she advise when that task force will report back to government and when staff and patients can expect to see some significant improvement? Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you. I'm grateful to Ms Dogdale for her question. Um, the task force is work is a continuous piece of work. Um, I receive regular uh, reports from it on uh, the progress it is making. I'm pleased to say that, uh, albeit it's only uh, a short time, and, and I wouldn't overclaim this, but what we have seen is a small improvement in NHS Lothian's performance in terms of accident in emergency. I'm very happy to update uh, Ms Dugdale on the work of the task force and other MSPs with a particular uh, local interest in the work of NHS Lothian uh, as the task force continues its work. But there is no particular, you know, go in, look at things, report and go away again. They are working with uh, healthcare staff in NHS Lothian uh, and with the management team there to make improvements on the ground, which is where I think is the right place for them to be. George Adam to be followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you, presiding officer. On Sunday, the Chancellor said that in the event of a no-deal Brexit, his quote was, frankly, we'd need to have a new budget that sets out the different strategy for the future. He then promptly forgot about Brexit yesterday. But for the record, and for the sake of all those that are working in our National Health Service, has the Scottish Government been given any assurances by this UK Government that in the event of a non-deal Brexit, that their commitments to the NHS spending will be kept and not just thrown away in any new budget? Cabinet Secretary. No such assurances have been given, Presiding Officer, and as I said earlier, all of that simply adds to the significant uncertainty that our staff in the NHS are facing, added to the uncertainty of those very valuable members of our healthcare workforce who are EU nationals. And I, uh, along with everyone else, I have little hope that it would be heard, but I urge uh, not only the UK government, but our colleagues here in the Conservative benches to join with us and press very hard for some of this resolution to be given. Uh, and they could start by giving us uh, assurances in terms of the consequentials going forward. Bill Bowman to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. While health boards were able to make savings last year of around 500 million, the Audit Scotland report has said that this was largely thanks to one-off measures like building sales. Further savings will obviously have to be made in the future, and since they cannot come from building sales or creative accounting, as we saw in NHS Tayside, how will the Cabinet Secretary ensure, how will she ensure they do not come from areas that will compromise patient safety, 
and patient care. Thank you. And my thanks to Mr Bowman for his question. I need to make one point about savings that are required from our NHS boards. Um, the, where they save money, they keep the money that they save, and they're expected to then use that money precisely for uh, patient services and patient care. I have been very clear with all our boards that as they look at how they make best use of, our of their resources, uh, patient-centred care and quality care uh, has to be the number one priority. And as we monitor uh, their use of resources and their uh, spending plans, their own uh, budgets going forward, we will be paying very careful attention to where they are looking uh, to make reductions in costs in order to apply those funds elsewhere. And the, the, the core answer to uh, Mr Bowman's question is you, um, you focus on quality, quality produces reform, reform produces financial prudence and good use of resources. That is absolutely my experience in the health service and that is the way we will do it going forward. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary rightly said that this is an annual report but she will also know that the Auditor General's warnings of the need for change have grown more urgent year on year. Given the importance of public engagement in meeting these challenges, does she agree with the Auditor General that better information is needed on how the NHS uses funding to support change and that reporting on progress towards Vision 2020 needs to be made public. If she does agree with those views uh, in this report, how will she deliver those changes? Cabinet Secretary. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Macdonald for those questions, important questions. And yes, I do agree. I, re I have said that I, accepted, I have accepted uh, all the recommendations in uh, the uh, Audit Scotland report and I'm hopeful that I will shortly have the opportunity uh, to meet with the Auditor General in order to discuss uh, what is in that report uh, and take her mind on some of the other areas where she thinks we might uh, make improvements uh, over the coming year. Uh, we are, I think, uh, clearly committed to transparency of information. We make uh, information public, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more that we can do. And I'd be very happy to hear of any propositions from across this chamber about what more we can do, because it's not just about making information public, it's about making information accessible uh, and understood. And uh, I think that we have a way to go uh, in, in that regard, in terms of individual health boards and ourselves as government, and I'm very keen to look at how we might do that. Colin Beatty. <clears throat> Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what Audit Scotland observed in their report on the long term increase in health spending in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, um, in terms of the long term uh, health spending um, in Scotland, uh, the Audit Scotland report said that Fraser Allender Institute estimates that the health resource budget is likely to have to increase by around 2% per year to stand still. Um, what I have said in my statement and otherwise is that the commitment made in the financial framework, our medium term financial framework, sets out additional funding for the health portfolio of £3.3 billion by 2023 24, which represents a 2.9% increase in real terms. Now, that is, uh, as I said at the time when I made that uh, statement, and as I said when I made uh, the waiting times improvement plan. Uh, when I published that and made that statement, uh, there, there, this is predicated on the UK government making good its commitment from June for consequentials. Uh, they've already failed in the yeah. first year of that. Yeah. Uh, I hope that they will not fail in future years. Uh, but what we absolutely need from them is uh, how they are going to make good the shortfall uh, in this first year uh, and what they are going to do in future years so that we can have a realistic uh, forward look and understand whether or not we can make our political choices and our com political commitment good or whether the UK government is going to let us down yet again. Yeah, and Neil Finlay. <clears throat> the weekend we saw NHS Lothian exposed taking in private patients for millions of pounds worth of procedures and diagnostic tests while any uh, private uh, procedures and diagnostic tests while NHS patients wait up to 60 weeks and beyond on waiting lists. Does the Cabinet Secretary understand just how angry patients are who are waiting with worry and pain? How angry are they at this unacceptable situation and what are you going to do about it? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, in terms of um, the, the situation that Mr um, Finlay refers to, uh, I am not best pleased myself, I have to say. Um, from my point of view, uh, our NHS boards should deal with private patients only in circumstances where uh, life is at risk. Uh, my understanding is it is something like £2.2 .2 million, pounds, so it's not an a enormous amount of money. Uh, that doesn't, however, lessen uh, uh, my concern about what uh, NHS Lothian have done here. And what I have already done is asked for detail on the circumstances in which they have uh, dealt with th that private sector in terms of treating patients from the private sector, the circumstances, um, and whether or not they can justify that they were able to do that because they had capacity in terms of their services for NHS patients. Uh, once I have seen what they wish to tell me on that, then I will make a decision about what I do, uh, not only in terms of NHS Lothian, but in terms of any other board, so that there is real clarity that NHS resources are focused on NHS patients uh, and that that is the right direction for us to go on and that pri the, private, the treatment of private sector patients should be, of course, uh, possible when there is a, a matter of life or death at risk, but otherwise I do not expect to see it in our NHS in Scotland. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary and Ministers, for their cooperation. That concludes that statement. We're now going to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on Motion 14509 in the name of Kate Forbes on a digital society for all, working together to maximise the benefits of digital inclusion. And again, I would encourage all members who wish to take part in this debate to press their request to speak buttons.